Well, thank you for your kind welcomes. Uh, it's very nice to be here. One of my good friends in Cambridge, in our college, um, had told me that his great-grandfather had been the rector of this university. Uh, so I went to meet the current rector this morning, and then we went to see the portrait of my friend's uh, great-grandfather on the corridor just outside. So Emilio Atacho had told me a lot about this building and about the university. So I felt I had a good introduction before coming to Zaragoza for the very first time. Well, as you probably are well aware, the Olympic Games are going to be in London next year. Um, everyone in London is already planning to be away, uh, probably here in Spain. Um, but uh, the Millennium Mathematics Project, which is an outreach program in mathematics and its applications for the general public and for school students and for their teachers, uh, have been selected by the uh, Olympic Committee to be the official educators uh, in Britain about mathematics and science of sport. So we have been very active and thought a lot about how we can exploit the presence of the Olympic Games to promote mathematics, mathematical understanding of sport, and the illumination of mathematics by examples from sport. So this talk is going to show you uh, a few of the interesting applications of mathematics to different sports. Not all of them are Olympic sports, but to show you how sport can enliven and inform the teaching of mathematics and how mathematics can tell you things about sport that you might not be able to discover in other ways. Well, the first example here is not really an Olympic sport. Uh, it's Philippe Petit, uh, the famous uh, tightrope walker. Here he's walking between the Twin Towers. Uh, back in 1974 in New York. And the question here is, why do tightrope walkers always carry those long poles? So whenever you see a tightrope walker walking across a wire, he's always carrying a long pole. And if you stop people in the university, even some mathematicians, and ask them why they carry a long pole, uh, you won't probably get the right answer. People say, Oh, it's to lower the center of gravity, but actually raises the center of gravity. Uh, or uh, it's to make you more stable in some way, but they don't quite know in what way. So the answer, in fact, is not about center of gravity particularly, but it's about something that in mechanics we call inertia. So if we have a heavy object and we want to move it, what matters about that object is not just its weight, but the distribution of the weight. And this is what we call inertia in engineering or in mechanics. And if we have two spheres, so this one hollow and this one solid, but they have the same mass and the same size, so they'll need to be made out of different materials, and you try to move them or you try to spin them, then you will find that what matters is how the mass is distributed. And the object that has got the mass far away from the center in a shell is much harder to move than the object that has the mass that is more evenly spread. So the inertia depends on the mass distribution, and the inertia looks like the mass the square of the size, but also a factor that depends on the concentration of the mass. So if it's a solid sphere, that concentration factor is two-fifths. But if all the mass is far away from the center in the outside, the concentration factor is two-thirds, and the inertia is larger. So this is a general principle that if mass is far away from the center, the inertia is larger and it's harder to move. And you move more slowly if someone pushes you. So if we look at our tightrope walker, what's happening with that pole is that mass is being moved far away from the center of the tightrope walker. 
and the inertia of the tightrope walker is being made larger. And so when he wobbles, he wobbles more slowly. So the period of the wobble is proportional to the square root of the inertia. So you can try this for yourself if you mark a line on the floor and uh, you're challenged to walk along it usually when you're stopped by the police, maybe when you're driving, uh, you'll find it's quite difficult to, to balance or to stand still. But if you put your arms out, it is much easier. So what you're doing, like the tightrope walker, is that you are buying time. You're wobbling more slowly, so you have more time to correct uh, and restore your balance. So this is the first little example of inertia. And if we look in other places in sport, we see the same sort of idea. So this is Bradley Wiggins. I think he has three Olympic gold medals in cycling, and he'll probably have uh, a few more uh, next year. Uh, I think, remarkably, he came third in the Tour de France uh, the year before last, in the first time he had ever tried uh, road racing. So his specialist event is uh, the pursuit, which is really one mile or something like five minutes, 4,000 meters. But he came third in the Tour de France at the first attempt uh, on the road. Now his bike is not like your bike. So his bike has these solid disc wheels. So if you try to drive in the street with this bike, as soon as you turn the handle, you will go on the floor because of the air resistance can't go through the wheel. But on the velodrome track, he always cycles perpendicular to the curved surface. He has no brakes on the racing bike, uh, but he's not going to fall off, he hopes. So why do cyclists have these wheels? Well, if you have an ordinary wheel with uh, the mass all in the outside, with very light spokes, the inertia is higher. So if you press on the pedal, the wheel will respond more slowly. But if your wheel is a disc, the inertia is half as big. And when you apply pressure to the wheel, the wheel will move faster. So typically what you'll find is that road racers who do have to turn the wheel into the wind will have a disc wheel maybe on the back and a much more open wheel on the front. So again, the idea of inertia is what is driving the design of a racing bicycle. But these examples are rather simple. The wheel is essentially a two-dimensional object. But solid things have three dimensions about which their mass can be distributed. So that if we have a, a badminton racket like this, or a tennis racket, you can rotate it about three axes. So you can rotate it about this vertical axis. I can lay it flat, and I can spin it round about this axis, about this center. And I can also spin it about that axis. OK, I can throw it about that axis. So there are three inertias for the motion of this racket. So in this direction, the mass is not very far away from the center. Uh, in this direction, there's quite a lot of mass uh, far from the center. And if I spin like this, it's not very much mass. So the behavior of this object will be different if it's rotated about any of the three axes. And it's a very important uh, property of rotational motion of a three-dimensional object that was discovered by Euler long ago, that the rotation about the intermediate axis, so the axis which is not the largest or the smallest inertia, is unstable. So if I spin it about this axis, uh, it's stable. If I were to put it flat on the floor and spin it round like this, it would be stable. But if I rotate it about this axis, it's unstable. So notice this is the top, it has the label on the top. So if I throw this and catch it, it's now on the bottom. So as it's gone up, it's done a flip, it's done a twist, and it's now come back off. So I won't do it again, because I'll drop it. <laughs> so uh, 
What's interesting about this is that if you uh, look at gymnasts, so if you look at female gymnast on the beam, you get extra credit if you do a, a somersault with a twist. But you can see that if you change the shape of your body so that about that axis the inertia is intermediate, you will do a twist without trying. You can't avoid doing the twist. So in gymnastics, one of the skills is to change the inertia of your body so that you will rotate or twist in different ways. And here are two little cartoons that by crouching the body up like this, you re compress the mass. It comes closer to the center and the inertia goes downwards. As you reach your arms up like this, the inertia becomes as large as it can be. In between, the inertia will be intermediate. So this is why you see divers leaving the high dive board. They may compress like this, and so they will rotate very fast. If they then stretch their arms out like this, they will stop rotating, and then they can enter the water straight. So changing your inertia increases your spin rate, inversely as one over the size of your arm span. We see this behavior, obviously, with divers. You can see these two Chinese divers changing the inertia distribution of their body. You see it with ice skaters bringing their arms in, spinning faster and faster. You actually see it with runners. So if, you, if you're a track runner, you'll notice that uh, people in middle distances tend to keep their arms quite high up. If you're running uphill, uh, or in very difficult, muddy, cross-country conditions, you tend to keep your arms lower. So when your arms are very high, with a very small change, your inertia is smaller, and you will change direction, can change lane much more easily than if your arm is lower. But if you want to run uphill, you need to have your arms pushing much harder. Cyclists, we've just seen. Uh, tennis players also. Uh, with the racket strike. So inertia is a central idea uh, in many sports. So anywhere where there is rotation, uh, where there is balance, where there is spin uh, on the diving board, inertia is a key concept. I want to change to look at rowing now, and something that's really uh, a mixture of mechanics and number theory. If you look at this rowing eight here, there are eight oars men, I think, here. And the way in which they're arranged, one oar here on the left, on the right, left, right, left, right, left, right. This pattern is called the rig, or the rigging of the boat. And there are no rules in rowing. You can, uh, you can have these people arranged in any way you wish. <coughs> But in practice, you always see <coughs> rowing eights rigged like this. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. And here is a four. Right, left, right, left. Now, <coughs> a, a year or half or so ago, um, I did a study of this type of configuration to see if it really was the best way to organize your rowers. And curiously, it is not. And the reason is rather interesting that if you, if you take moments of the forces being exerted on the boat by each of these oars, you find that this configuration produces an asymmetry and makes the boat wiggle from side to side as it goes along. So how does that work? So let, let's just look at four, okay? So here is the... Um, the boat's going that direction, the rowers are facing in this direction, and here's the standard configuration, the standard rig. Now what happens when you pull on the oar? The oar is held in a little rowlock, and when you pull on the oar, it exerts a force on the boat. And like all forces, you can split it into two components that are at right angles. So there's one component of the force 
which goes in this direction and pushes the boat along. But there is another component at right angles to it. And in the first half of the stroke, you can imagine what's happening to the oar. It's pushing on the, pulling on the rowlock, and that force is towards the boat. Once the oar reaches halfway, the pressure is off, okay, and you just recover. And then the force goes in the other direction. And then when you pull again, that force comes towards the boat. So this force is constantly changing direction. It's first in this direction, then in this direction, this direction. So this is the pattern of forces. So what you want to do is to take moments of this changing force about the end of the boat. And what happens? Well, let's suppose the distance from the stroke to the rudder is S, and the distance in between the rowers is R. And we'll see that none of those things matter. Well, in the first half of the stroke, the total force on the boat is a distance S times minus N plus S plus R times plus N minus S plus 2R times N plus S times 3R times N. All the S's cancel out, and the net force on the boat is plus 2R in that direction. The next half stroke, the forces are all the same, but N changes to minus N, and there is now a force in this direction equal to minus 2NR. So with each stroke, there is this oscillating force that makes the boat wiggle as it goes through the water and wastes energy. And it's corrected by the cox steering to correct it, or if there's no cox in the fore, by the stroke making adaptations to the way he's rowing. In either case, it's wasted energy, and the boat is not going as fast as it could do. Now, what I found looking at this problem uh, rather simply is that if you look at all the possible ways in which you could configure the oarsman, then for the four, there is one way to do it, so that there is a zero moment and there is no wiggle. And this is the way you organize the rowers, because then when you work out the moment, minus ns plus n, s plus r plus n s plus 2r minus n s plus 3r, the net force is zero all the time. This, it turned out, had been discovered by the Italians uh, back in the 1950s by accident, it turned out, when they were training on Lake Como. Uh, so as a joke, one morning when the crew didn't really want to train, they changed around the rigging in the boat, thinking that their coach would call off the training session. But instead, he insisted that, uh, that they still do the time trial on Lake Como. And if they didn't meet the time trial uh, standard, they would just have to row it again. Uh, well, it turned out that they not only met the time trial standard, they broke the course record on Como with this configuration. So after that, they always used this configuration that year. They won the European Championships uh, and then, I think, the Olympic Games uh, subsequently. German crews then used this type of configuration. But what had not really been examined was what were all the possibilities for eights? And this problem, because you've noticed that all the the NSs always cancel out because there are the same number of rowers on that side of the boat as that side of the boat. And it doesn't matter what the spacing is. They all cancel out uh, as well. And what the problem amounts to is just taking the numbers from 1 to 8 and sprinkling plus signs, 4 plus signs, and 4 minus signs in such a way that the sum is 0. And these are the only ways in which you can do that. And you can see 
one of the recipes, you know, 1 plus 8 minus 7 plus 2 plus 3 plus uh, uh, 5 and so on. So you can, you can just take them in pairs so they cancel out. So this configuration here is just two of the Italian 4s put next to each other. And this one, which is sometimes called the German rig, is just an Italian uh, pair which has another one put inside it. But these two are new. Okay, so these are the other possibilities. This one's got four on one side and two and two. So I wrote a paper about this in American Journal of Physics which seemed to sort of attract lots of attention from the news media and from rowing uh, people and there was a, uh, an article in the World Rowing uh, Association's magazine uh, and then New Scientist magazine commissioned some trials on the River Thames with the University of London crew uh, using this particular configuration uh, and I think then also that one. So if you look on the web you'll find some video and film of these trials and lots of people commenting on how easy or better and so forth it was to row in these configurations. So the interesting point here is that <clears throat> this is only possible, it's only possible to have one of these wiggle-free rigs if the number of oarsmen in the boat is divisible by four. So you can do it for a four or for an eight or for a twelve. And this is a little problem in uh, finite series. Okay, so you can prove various theorems about this. You can find the ways to do it with 32 oarsmen and so forth. Well, from rowing, let's move on. Oh, before we go, I, after I'd done this, I found this photograph. Um, and uh, this is the final of the eights in the Olympic Games in Beijing. So I think Britain are coming third. Canada are winning here crossing the line here. And if you look very closely, they are using one of these rigs, okay, with the two in the middle. So I think it's this one. It's the German rig, the one that was known. So if you look carefully, uh, this oarsman is left, right, left, right, right, le uh, left, right, left. And when we made contact with the Canadian coach, uh, Nolte, I think, who's one of the world's experts on uh, sort of rowing technical matters, uh, he said they didn't do it for any of these sorts of reasons. I think they probably didn't know about these sorts of reasons. But it was just something to do with the size of the oarsmen, giving certain people more room uh, to sort of move their legs uh, in this configuration. So it was a much more practical consideration. So theirs was a zero moment uh, configuration with this mathematical structure. Well, let's move on to throwing things, okay? Putting, putting the shot. Uh, this gentleman here is called Randy Barnes and he holds the world shot put record from a very long time ago. Um, it's 23 meters and 12 centimeters. Uh, he was subsequently, I think, banned for some period of time uh, because of drug taking and then returned. Um, and the question is, what's the best angle at which to launch a shot to maximize the range? And this is an interesting problem that you could meet at school. And why I'm telling you about it is the answer is maybe not what you expect. There are two surprises mathematical surprises about this problem. So what you know from school is if you launch a projectile from the ground with some speed uh, and there's no air resistance, that's a very big assumption. If you throw a tennis ball, it will not behave like you learn at school because air resistance is very, very important and changes the trajectory uh, in a major way. But if you're throwing a 16-pound iron ball, air resistance doesn't really matter. So we can forget about it. Well, what you learn at school is if you launch something with speed v at an angle theta to the ground, then 
the range, the total distance of flight before it hits the ground again is given by this combination V squared divided by the acceleration due to gravity. So if you throw something in Mexico City, the acceleration due to gravity is smaller, uh, it will go further. But it depends on the launch angle in this way. And the sine of an angle can never be bigger than one, and it's equal to one when the angle is 90 degrees. So the largest range will be when twice theta is 90 degrees, when theta is 45 degrees. However, that's not really the correct answer for putting the shot. And the reason is because you don't launch the shot from ground level. You launch it maybe from two meters above the ground. And so if you launch the shot from up here, then the formula for the maximum range is changed by the height above the ground that you launch the shot from. This doesn't make a big difference. It will mean that the optimal angle uh, is not 45 degrees, uh, that it's closer to something like 43 degrees. But if you look at the photographs of people like Mr. Barnes and other people, uh, your second surprise is that they don't launch the shot anywhere near 43 degrees. They tend to launch the shot with a much lower angle, 37 to 39 degrees. So what's going on here is that there is another constraint in this problem. So there is a correlation between the angle of launch and the speed with which you're able to throw things. So you know that you are much stronger at lifting things, pushing things upwards, than you are at pushing things outwards. So if you try and do a sort of shoulder press, you will not be able to press as high a weight as if you do a bench press. So there is another constraint in this problem. And what the constraint is, here this is some experimental investigation, that the speed with which you're able to launch the projectile is actually significantly correlated with the angle at which you launch it. So the smaller the angle, the higher the speed. And the lower the angle, the smaller the speed. So this is statistical data from huge numbers of throwers. Uh, measuring their ability to launch things. So if you add this constraint to the projectile problem, then here is a picture of the range uh, that you can obtain, the maximum range, uh, and this is the launch angle, and these are different speeds of being able to throw it. And you can see that the optimum angle depends on the launch speed it depends on the range in quite a complicated way. So the answer for a very good thrower like Randy Barnes is a little bit different than the answer for someone as a, a school child doing the shot put. So what you find is that the best launch angle is typically around 34 to 38 degrees for a world-class shot putter because of this constraint on the projection angle and the launch speed. So this is an example of what we might call constrained optimization. Okay, there's a hidden constraint in the problem that people hadn't thought about. Well, I want to say something about judging now. So there are many sports where there is subjective judging. So in diving, gymnastics, uh, ice skating is the classic case. And uh, so strange was the subjective judging in ice skating, so open to corruption that it was changed after the Salt Lake City Olympics. It was changed for two reasons. Uh, one, because some judges were found to have cheated, okay, and to favor uh, competitors from some countries. Uh, so much so that two gold medals were awarded in one com competition to compensate for cheating that was discovered. But the other reason was because a logical fallacy was uncovered in the voting procedure. And this is a fallacy that mathematicians 
are well aware of. So one area of mathematics uh, that's rather interesting is the study of voting systems. And the Nobel Prize in Economics was given back in the 1970s to Ken Arrow, who established a famous theorem to show that there wasn't a voting system that was free of all possible problems or paradoxes. But normally when mathematicians consider voting systems, in their axioms they exclude a particular possibility from being allowed. And we'll see this possibility turned out to be at the heart of the Olympic skating judging and the problems that arose. So this is um, the ladies figure skating. I should say my daughter is a professional uh, ice skating coach and figure skater of this sort, but I, I don't think I've, no, I haven't included any pictures of her, so um, she won't be embarrassed. Um, and this is the judging situation in the ladies figure skating. Just before the last skater is going to skate, at the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics. Now you probably don't know how the judging used to work. So here are some famous names, Michelle Kwan, uh, Hughes, Cohen, Slutskaya. So these are the four leading competitors. And the way the skating works is that there's first a short program, okay? And uh, the old way of giving marks, you remember, you see on the television people getting 5.9, 6.0. Everyone gets very excited about these marks, but they don't mean anything. Nobody stores those marks. They're not kept. So if you score all sixes in your program, it doesn't actually count for any more than if you scored 5.9s, but you finished in the same position. So all that happens, all those scores are added up, and the person that finishes first is given half a mark. The person that finishes second is given one mark. The person that finishes third is given 1.5 of a mark, and the person that's, uh, so she was third, the person who's fourth was given two. So what's really being kept here are just the positions, okay? So a half for first, one for second, one and a half for third, two for fourth. Then the long program happens. More weight is given to the long program, and so the position marks are doubled. So if you're in first place, you would be given one. If you came second, you would be given uh, two. If you were third, you're given three. If you're fourth, you're given four. And then what happens is that these marks are added together. And the person with the lowest mark is the winner. So this all sounds OK, but it's like adding positions, not scores. OK? So what if you've got all sixes in the first round, it doesn't help you particularly. OK? That's all forgotten. So what happened in the Olympic Games was these are the results at the end of the first short program. And then in, after these three skaters had skated, uh, Hughes was the best in the long program, Kwan was second, and Cohen was third. So if we add them together, Kwan is in first place, Hughes is second, and Cohen is third. And then Slutskaya skates, and what happens Slutskaya is ranked second in the long program behind Hughes, and Kwan is now third. So when we add them together, Hughes and Slutskaya are tied. Now in a tie, the best long program is taken as the winner. So Hughes wins, Slutskaya is second, and Kwan is third. So something very, very strange has happened here. Before Slutskaya skates, Kwan is first and Hughes is second. After Slutskaya skates, Hughes is ranked above Kwan. So the performance of Slutskaya has changed the relative rankings of Hughes and Kwan. So how can this be? How can the performance of Slutskaya alter whether Kwan is better than Hughes? So this is a feature of some voting systems 
uh, that mathematicians know is, is undesirable and you wish to, uh, to remove it. There's a famous story about a, uh, a philosopher who went into a restaurant and the waiter uh, came and, and said, you know, what, what do you want to order? There's fish or there is beef? And the philosopher said, I, I'll have fish. And then later on, the waiter came back and said, oh, and we've also got pork. Do you want to change your choice? And he said, yes, I'll have beef. <laughs> so that's what's happened here. Okay. There's an irrelevant alternative. Uh, so what then happened as a result of this problem was uh, you now add the scores. So it would have always been much more sensible just to add up the scores. 5.9, 6.0, if you add all the scores, you don't have this fallacy. The root of this fallacy is that you mustn't add preferences. You mustn't add orderings. And here's a simple example uh, that suppose that you have to make a choice, uh, you know, maybe in your election or something like that, between three candidates, A, B, and C. And there are three voters. And the first voter puts them in order, A, B, C. They're his preferences. The second voter prefers B first, C second, and A third. And the third voter puts C first, A second, and B third. So if we add up the results, we see that A beats B here and here, but not here. So A beats B, 2-1. B beats C, 2-1. But C beats A, 2-1. So it's non-transitive. So you mustn't add preferences. When I gave a talk about this many years ago in China, there was lots of sort of unrest in the, in the audience. And afterwards, someone said, oh, this is the way we work out all the gradings of the schools and the candidates. But, uh, um, so you must be very careful when you uh, use voting systems or subjective voting systems uh, in order to decide events. Well, let's look at something to do with probability uh, and Let's pick on football, uh, and let's pick on the English Premier League, because it's more interesting sometimes than other countries' leagues. But, uh, although we'll see, not as interesting as you might think. So the idea is just to ask the question, is this league and all its results distinguishable from a random process? Do we actually need to play all these games, or could we just draw the results out of a hat? and save lots of money, lots of time, lots of problems. Uh, would anyone be able to tell? Well, if you look at the Premier League in England, there are 20 teams. And they all play each other home and away. So each team plays 38 games. If you look at the statistics of football, not just in England, but in most European countries, the probability of a draw is very, very close to a quarter. So one game in four is a draw. Well, let's assume, to be simple, that the rest of the probability, there's a 3 8 chance of a home team winning and a 3 8 chance of an away team winning. So 2 8 is a draw, 3 8 is home, 3 8 away. Now, if you've got an eight-sided dice, you could actually play all the games by hand, sort of thing you used to do when I was a child, you'd have competitions and, and use a die. But better to use a computer. So you can label your teams, 1 to 38, play them all against each other by tossing the eight-sided dice on the computer, set up all the results, create a new football league, OK, from these random results. And what do you find? Well, uh, the team at the top we'll call team number one. OK, uh, and this is how they got on. They won 19, uh, they drew 9, they lost 10. They got 67 points. And here's the bottom team. Uh, they got 31. And now I just picked uh, a few years ago when Arsenal won the league. This is what the real results look like. OK, 
And what is interesting about this, uh, and your Spanish league will be just the same, there are two or three teams at the top that are doing much better than having a chance of three-eighths of winning. Okay, it's more like 0.7. So these teams are doing much better than the random model. But everyone else is beautifully consistent with a random model, all the way down to the bottom. There's a little bit of deviation in the middle. And if you think you can understand that, We've assumed the probability of winning at home and winning away is the same. The top teams don't care if they're home or away. They win all the time. The bottom teams don't care if they're home or away. They lose all the time. <laughs> but the teams in the middle, they tend to win at home, but they lose away. So you need a slightly better model. But you can see from this, I mean, I always used to say that the Premier League is the most uncompetitive league in the world because there are these few teams dominating completely. But I have to revise this. The Spanish league is the most uncompetitive in the world because there are just two teams at the top. And I would bet that if you do this problem for the Spanish league, you'll find everyone else is following the random model fairly closely. But Barcelona and Real Madrid will be way at the top. I don't know where Zaragoza is, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, whether it's up here or whether it's down there or even whether it's on another sheet down here. Uh, Well, another more sophisticated uh, application of probability and statistics to sport, which is rather interesting, more interesting maybe than a football example, are scoring systems. So if you look around sport for historical and other reasons, there are very, very different and strange scoring systems. So uh, tennis, you know, there are games and sets and matches. Um, croquet, uh, there's another system. Squash used to have a system where you could only score a point if you won a point when you're serving. And volleyball used to be like that, and also badminton. I think they changed the rules now. So there are various reasons for these scoring systems. I mean, one is to have more uh, exciting points, so they're for the benefit of the crowd, the audience. So they want the game to last longer and not to be so one-sided. It's a bit like the World Cup you know, in football, or worse, in cricket, or the Champions League. No one seems to want anybody to be eliminated from these competitions. You know, so you'll spend months playing games in the group stage, countless games, and then you'll find four teams have been eliminated. Uh, that's all. And they'll move over to the Europa League uh, and play there. But I want to pick on table tennis. This is interesting because they changed their rules not very long ago. So when I used to play table tennis uh, at school or at home, we would play to 21 points. And we would play the best of three games. Uh, you had to, in fact, play to at least 21 points. You need a two-point margin. And you had five serves. But a few years ago, the rules were changed. And in Olympic table tennis, you play to 11 points. And it's the best of seven games. And I think you just have two serves. So the idea is to remove the strong bias that the server has for a long period of time, and to make it more exciting for the crowd. If games are one-sided, they don't go on for so long. So let's look at this from a mathematical point of view. You can model a game like this as being a sequence of random outcomes, uh, what probability theorists would call Bernoulli trials. So I won't go through all the algebra. All we need to know, let's assume that the probability of one player winning a point uh, is p. And we'll assume it's the same for every point whether they're serving or not. We can improve this if, if we want to. But. And so the probability of losing the point is 1 minus p. If we assume that the players are very good, they're very evenly matched, so Olympic competitors, then p is going to be close uh, to a half. 
I should say in Cambridge, in recent years, we had a very remarkable student. Uh, the most famous person in all of China, a woman you know, who's four Olympic gold medals in the table tennis and uh, I think 15 world championships. Uh, she retired when she was 24 and was voted China's person of the millennium a few years ago. So she came to do a PhD in Cambridge and uh, would sometimes, I think, play table tennis in the college league. I think nobody could even see the ball. So she, so she was so fantastically good. So she's regarded as the best ever table tennis player, male or female. Uh, and I think she's probably leading the Chinese Olympic delegation to London next year. She was the deputy last time. Well, anyway, let's go back. Evenly matched opponents. Let's assume P is a half plus just another small quantity, S. So S is the bias towards one player. Well, what happens uh, if we uh, take our probability model, what we're interested in is what's the probability that you win n points before you lose n points. So if n is 21, you know, that would be the chance of winning under the old rules. Uh, and if you do that, uh, make relevant approximations, use Sterling's formula to get rid of the factorials, you find the probability of winning the whole game if you're playing to n points looks like a half plus this quantity here. Square root of the number of games over pi times the little bias in each point. So what's interesting here, of course, the more games you play, the larger n is, the bigger this probability will be, be than a half. So what you're interested in here is you want skill to win over luck. If you decided the game by just playing one point, like tossing a coin, there would be a very strong chance that the weaker player would win the game, win the whole match. But the more games you play, the greater the chance that the more skillful player will win. But how many games do you need to play to be sh fairly sure that that will happen? So that's the bias, uh, the way the bias in one point carries over into a game. And now suppose that we play M games, M sets. What happens then? Well, in each one of those, you have this bias, okay? Let's say it's S primed, but you're inheriting a bias from the game if equal to 2S times root N over pi. So the bias from the sets is given by this quantity, that's the number of sets, where S is now the bias from the games. So the overall extra probability, in addition to a half, if you play N games, or N points in a game, and M games in a set, looks like this. The key quantity is M times N. So that's what determines how much better than just a half you're doing in terms of probability. Well, under the old rules of probability of uh, table tennis, okay, uh, N was uh, 21, and you had to win two games to win the match. Okay, best of three. So M times N was 42. Badminton is the same still. Under the new rules, you have to win four out of seven. So N is, M is four and N is 11. So M times N is 44. So they're very, very close. So I suspect that whoever invented the new rules knew something about this type of probability model. So the new rules reward skill almost equally as they did in the old rules. But if you're playing to 11 at home, you know, you might say, well, let's just play best of three. Okay, we're not going to play best of seven. Then your M would be two, and M times M would be 22. And you were rewarding skill nearly half as much only as if you played best of seven. 
So this is a nice example of how some really reasonably sophisticated probability modeling allows you to understand this type of set point structure of, and you can apply this to tennis, uh, to badminton, to volleyball, many of these other types of game. Well, let's, nearly at the end, let's look at strength. This person is the strongest person in the world, pound for pound. Okay, he's a very uh, lightweight weightlifter. Uh, he's got more Olympic gold medals than I can remember. So he changed nationality once, so he couldn't compete at one game. So I think he has three Olympic gold medals and should have had a fourth. He started when he was 16. But he can lift more than three times his body weight. Well, weightlifting is interesting because the competitors are divided into categories according to their weights. Okay, so this fellow, you know, who will be about this tall, will not be competing against uh, the super heavyweight weightlifter who will uh, weigh, uh, you know, about uh, 30 stone and be about uh, two meters tall. Uh, so how does strength depend on your weight? Well, the interesting thing is that if you think of uh, a body that has a characteristic size, a diameter, say, uh, R, then the weight looks proportional to the mass. Mass looks like density times volume. And we all have roughly the same density. So your weight is proportional to your volume. It's a very good approximation. And your volume will be proportional to some size cubed. But what about your strength? Your strength is different. So if you think about something that's uh, rather long and thin, like this pole here, what do you have to do to break this? OK. You have to break a little slice, an area of atomic bonds at some point. And it doesn't matter if this racket was a kilometer long. It would be no easier, no harder to break it here. So the total volume, the total mass of this object doesn't really matter. What matters is this area that you have to snap. And if it's much thicker, it's much harder to break it, because there are more bonds to break. If it's much thinner, like a drinking straw or a match, it's much easier. So the strength of materials depends on an area, this cross-sectional area that you have to break. So uh, it depends not on R cubed, but on R squared, a size squared. So you can see that as something grows in size, its strength does not grow as rapidly as its weight or its volume. You can see this if you look at a cat and a kitten. So when a cat is very small, its tail sticks upright, vertically. It's smaller and it's strong enough to support its tail. But as the cat gets bigger, its strength does not grow as rapidly as its weight or its volume. And it is not strong enough to support its tail vertically. And the tail will bend over. So the message here is that strength and weight grow in different ways. You can see that if you take the three halves power of the strength, it's proportional to the weight. So your strength is proportional to the two-thirds power of your weight. As you get bigger, your strength to weight ratio gets smaller. And if you try to be a giant that's as big as this room, you will break. You will not be strong enough to support your weight. So this uh, little formula here is the interesting one. Let's apply it to weightlifters. You gauge the strength of a weightlifter by the weight that they lift, and we know the weight of the weightlifter. Weightlifters keep very careful statistics of their records. So they tell you precisely the weight of a weightlifter when they lift. 
because they have to be in a weight category. So if we do a log-log plot of strength weight lifted against the weight of the lifter, we should find a slope of two-thirds. So if we take the world weightlifting records, the agreement is pretty good. Okay, so here I've plotted the cube of the strength against the square of the weight. And it's very, very close to following this very, very simple law. So what you learn from this is that the strongest pound for pound, kilogram for kilogram weightlifters are the ones furthest above this line, and the weakest ones, kilogram for kilogram, are actually the super heavy weightlifters. Because if they tried to lift this weight that this line predicts, they would break, their knees would break. So they can't keep up with this line. So this is an interesting, very simple example of how just scaling of strength against weight enables you to understand the whole trend of world weightlifting records. The great mystery in sport is why there are not uh, weight categories for putting the shot or throwing the hammer. Uh, as you probably notice, most shot putters are gigantic. They are very, very strong. Uh, there are no little shot putters for obvious reasons. Uh, whereas if there were weight categories in the shot put, uh, you would have very small shot putters who would throw the shot a long way, perhaps relatively much further than the very heavy ones. Well, finally, the sort of things students and high school kids always want to know. So what is the most dangerous human activity? What is the most extreme sporting or other activity that human beings uh, subject themselves to. And if you ask people, they all think it's being an astronaut or being a fighter pilot, being launched in the space shuttle. In fact, it's none of these things. It's drag car racing. So drag car racing uh, is a completely insane sport. It uh, originated in America. You sometimes see it in Britain. It tends to be conducted on old airfields. So these cars, which are really just fuel tanks, uh, they start from zero velocity at rest, and they go 400 meters. And typical fast times are about four seconds. Four seconds. So as interesting comparison, suppose the world Formula One racing car champion came past at 200 miles an hour at the same moment that this car started, it would still be beaten to the finish by the drag car. So as you can imagine, uh, the acceleration, you're up to 100 miles per hour uh, in 7 tenths of a second, typically. Uh, the acceleration forces on the drivers are uh, in excess of 6G. Higher than that, when they slow down, they throw out parachutes and dramatically decelerate. So this is much more extreme than being a fighter pilot uh, or being in a space shuttle. So the launch speed of this car is much greater than any space rocket being launched from Cape Canaveral. And while well, accelerations of this sort are very serious in that they produce detached retinas uh, and people who do this sport for a long time, have lots of serious eye problems. The other problems that they have are deafness, because the sound levels uh, from the engines and everything to do with the sport, uh, if you're a spectator, you're going to have this problem as well. Uh, and split your eardrums if you don't protect your ears or stand in the right place. This type of motion of these cars uh, is an interesting little problem in mechanics. So here's the last slide I'll show you. Uh, it's a sort of problem that you don't meet in mechanics at high school or perhaps even at university. It's a particular type of motion. It's motion at constant power. If you just ignore the little bit of frictional traction in the first split second as it gets going, this motion is motion at constant power. Power is force times velocity and force is mass times acceleration, so the power is mass times v dot times v, which is a half times the time derivative of v squared. So this motion, starting from rest, 
the square of the velocity is twice the power times the time. And so the distance that you go depends on the three halves power of the time. This is interesting because it seemed that in this uh, sport, there was some rule that had been people had conceived just from experience and measuring the results that is almost exactly this mathematical formula that you can derive for the speed against the distance. And Dragster's called it Huntingdon's rule, but it's really Newton's law in disguise. So uh, this is a very simple mechanics problem. You can make it better if you want, because most of the mass of the dragster is actually, a large fraction is fuel. And so it's a variable mass problem at constant power. So if you include this, it's a little more detail uh, in the problem. So uh, I don't recommend taking up drag car racing, but if you ever get a chance to watch it, uh, pay attention. It doesn't last very long. But uh, it's possible to understand what's going on pretty precisely just by using this simple mechanics. Well, our time is up. I hope I've given you some flavor of all manner of different applications of mathematics to different areas of sport. There are many, many other things we could have looked at. Swimming, uh, track athletics, timing problems, wind assistance, statistics of records, the probability of uh, drug testing errors and things of this sort. So the whole subject is a rather good collection of examples which are familiar to many people, uh, but hide some very interesting mathematics, and they challenge people to produce good mathematical models, to understand what it is you need to include in the mathematics and what it is you can leave out and still get a good approximation. So, I wish you luck uh, at the Olympic Games uh, and in the Champions League. <laughs> Thank you.